the liturgical year of Don Prosper Garanger. Passion Sunday. Today, if you shall hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts. The Holy Church begins her night office of this Sunday with these impressive words of the royal prophet. Formerly, the faithful considered it their duty to assist at the night office, at least on Sundays and feasts. They would have grieved to lose the grand teachings given by the liturgy. Such fervor has long since died out. The assiduity at the offices of the church, which was the joy of our Catholic forefathers, has now become a thing of the past. And even in countries which have not apostatized from the faith, the clergy have ceased to celebrate publicly offices at which no one assisted. Excepting in cathedral churches and in monasteries, the grand harmonious system of the divine praise has been abandoned, and the marvelous power of the liturgy has no longer its full influence upon the faithful. This is our reason for drawing the attention of our readers to certain beauties of the divine office, which would otherwise be totally ignored. Thus, what can be more impressive than this solemn invitatory of today's Maddens, which the church takes from one of the Psalms and which she repeats on every feria between this and Monday Thursday? She says, Today, if ye shall hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts. The sweet voice of your suffering, Jesus, now speaks to you, poor sinners. Be not your own enemies by indifference and hardness of heart. The Son of God is about to give you the last and greatest proof of the love that brought him down from heaven. His death is nigh at hand. Men are preparing the wood for the immolation of the new Isaac. Enter into yourselves and let not your hearts, after being touched with grace, return to their former obduracy, for nothing could be more dangerous. The great anniversaries we are to celebrate have a renovating power for these souls that faithfully correspond with the grace which is offered them, but they increase insensibly in those who let them pass without working their conversion. Today, therefore, if ye hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts. During the preceding four weeks, we have noticed how the malice of Jesus' enemies has been gradually increasing. His very presence irritates them, and it is evident that any little circumstance will suffice to bring the deep and long-nurtured hatred to a head. The kind and gentle manners of Jesus are drawing to him all hearts that are simple and upright. At the same time, the humble life he leads and the stern purity of his doctrines are perpetual sources of vexation and anger, both to the proud Jew that looks forward to the Messiah's being a mighty conqueror and to the Pharisee who corrupts the law of God that he may make it the instrument of his own base passions. Still, Jesus goes on working miracles. His discourses are more than ever energetic. His prophecies foretell the fall of Jerusalem and such a destruction to his famous temple that not a stone is to be left on a stone. The doctors of the law should at least reflect upon what they hear. They should examine these wonderful works, which render such strong testimony in favor of the Son of David. And they should consult those divine prophecies which, up to the present time, have been so literally fulfilled in his person. Alas, they themselves are about to carry them out to the very last iota. There is not a single outrage or suffering foretold by David and Isaiah as having to be put upon the Messiah, which these blind men are not scheming to verify. In them, therefore, was fulfilled that terrible saying, He that shall speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world nor in the world to come. The synagogue is nigh to a curse. Obstinate in her error, she refuses to see or to hear. She has deliberately perverted her judgment. She has extinguished within herself the light of the Holy Spirit. She will go deeper and deeper into evil, and at length fall into the abyss. This same lamentable conduct is but too often witnessed nowadays in those sinners who, by habitual resistance to the light, end by finding their happiness in sin. Neither should it surprise us that we find in people of our own generation a resemblance to the murderers of our Jesus, the history of his passion will reveal to us many sad secrets of the human heart and its perverse inclinations for what happened in Jerusalem happens also in every sinner's heart. His heart, according to the saying of St. Paul, is a Calvary where Jesus is crucified. There is the same ingratitude, the same blindness, 
the same wild madness with this difference, that the sinner who is enlightened by faith knows him who he crucifies, whereas the Jews, as the same apostle tells us, knew not the Lord of glory. Whilst, therefore, we listen to the gospel which relates the history of the Passion, let us turn the indignation which we feel for the Jews against ourselves and our own sins. Let us weep over the sufferings of our victim, for our sins caused him to suffer and die. Everything around us urges us to mourn. The images of the saints, the very crucifix on our altar, are veiled from our sight. The church is oppressed with grief. During the first four weeks of Lent, she compassionated her Jesus fasting in the desert. His coming sufferings and crucifixion and death are what now fill her with anguish. We read in today's gospel that the Jews threatened to stone the Son of God as a blasphemer, but his hour is not yet come. He is obliged to flee and hide himself. It is to express this deep humiliation that the church veils the cross. A God hiding himself that he may evade the anger of men? What a mystery! Is it weakness? Is it that he fears death? No, we shall soon see him going out to meet his enemies. But at present, he hides himself from them because all that had been prophesied regarding him has not been fulfilled. Besides, his death is not to be by stoning. He is to die upon a cross, the tree of malediction, which, from that time forward, is to be the tree of life. Let us humble ourselves as we see the Creator of heaven and earth thus obliged to hide himself from men who are bent on his destruction. Let us go back in thought to the sad day of the first sin, when Adam and Eve hid themselves because a guilty conscience told them they were naked. Jesus has come to assure us of our being pardoned, and lo, he hides himself, not because he is naked. He that is to the saints the garb of holiness and immortality but because he made himself weak, that he might make us strong. Our first parents sought to hide themselves from the sight of God. Jesus hides himself from the eye of men. But it will not be thus forever. The day will come when sinners, from whose anger he now flees, will pray to the mountains to fall on them and shield them from his gaze. But their prayer will not be granted, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with much power and majesty. This Sunday is called Passion Sunday because the church begins on this day to make the sufferings of our Redeemer her chief thought. It is called also Judica, from the first word of the introit of the Mass, and again, Neomania, that is, the Sunday of the new or the Easter moon, because it always falls after the new moon, which regulates the Feast of Easter. In the Greek church, this Sunday goes under the simple name of the fifth Sunday of the Holy Fast. The Mass. At Rome, the Sunday is in the Basilica of St. Peter. The importance of this Sunday, which never gives way to any feast, no matter what its solemnity may be, required that the place for the assembly of the faithful should be in one of the chief sanctuaries of the holy city. The introit is taken from the first verses of Psalm 42. The Messiah appeals to God's tribunal and protests against the sentence about to be pronounced against him by men. He likewise expresses his confidence in his Father's help, who, after his sufferings and death, will lead him in triumph into the Holy Mount. The introit, Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause from the nation that is not holy. Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful men. For thou art my God and my strength. Send forth thy light and thy truth. For they have conducted me and brought me to thy Holy Mount and into thy tabernacles. Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause from the nation that is not holy. Deliver me from the unjust and deceitful man, for thou art my God and my strength. The glory patri is not said during Passion Tide and Holy Week, unless a saint's feast is kept, but the introit is repeated immediately after the psalm. In the colic, the church prays that there may be produced in her children that total reformation which the holy season of Lent is intended to produce. This reformation is such that it will not only subject the body to the spirit, but preserve also the spirit itself from those delusions and passions to which it has been hitherto more or less a slave. The colic, mercifully look down on thy people, we beseech thee, O Almighty God, that by thy bounty and protection they may be governed and guarded 
both in body and soul. Then is added one of the following prayers against the persecutors of the church. Mercifully here we beseech thee, O Lord, the prayers of thy church, that all oppositions and errors being removed, she may serve thee with a secure liberty. For the Pope, O God, the pastor and ruler of all the faithful, look down in thy mercy on thy servant, whom thou hast appointed pastor over thy church, and grant, we beseech thee, that both by word and example he may edify all those that are under his charge, and, with the flock entrusted to him, arrive at length at eternal happiness. The epistle is the lesson of the epistle of St. Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews chapter 9. Brethren, Christ being come, and high priest of the good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and of oxen, and the ashes of a heifer, being sprinkled, sanctify such as are defiled, to the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who by the Holy Ghost offered himself unspotted unto God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And therefore he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death, for the redemption of those transgressions which were under the former testament, they that are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is by blood alone that man is to be redeemed. He has offended God. This God cannot be appeased by anything short of the extermination of his rebel. This God cannot be appeased by anything short of the extermination of his rebellious creature who, by shedding his blood, will give an earnest of his repentance and his entire submission to the Creator against whom he dared to rebel. Otherwise, the justice of God must be satisfied by the sinner suffering eternal punishment. This truth was understood by all the people of the ancient world, and all confessed it by shedding the blood of victims, as in the sacrifices of Abel at the very commencement of the world, in the hecatombs of Greece, in the countless immolations whereby Solomon dedicated the temple. And yet God thus speaks to his people, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify to thee, I am God thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices, and thy burnt offerings are always in my sight. I will not take calves out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy flocks. I need them not, for all the beasts of the woods are mine. If I should be hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Shall I eat the flesh of bullocks, or shall I drink the blood of goats? Thus God commands the blood of victims to be offered to him, and at the same time declares that neither it nor they are precious in his sight. Is this a contradiction? No. God would hereby have man understand that it is only by blood that he can be redeemed, but that the blood of brute animals cannot affect this redemption. Can the blood of man himself bring him his own redemption and appease God's justice? No, not even man's blood, for it is defiled. And even were it undefiled, it is powerless to compensate for the outrage done to God by sin. For this there was needed the blood of a God. Such was the blood of Jesus, and he has come that he may shed it for our redemption. In him is fulfilled the most sacred of the figures of the old law. Once each year the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, there to make intercession for the people. He went within the veil, even to the Ark of the Covenant, but he was not allowed to enjoy this great privilege unless he entered the holy place carrying in his hands the blood of a newly offered victim. The Son of God, the true high priest, is now about to enter heaven, and we are to follow him thither. But unto this he must have an offering of blood, and that blood can be none other than his own. We are going to assist at this high compliance with the divine ordinance, let us open our hearts that this precious blood may, as the Apostle says in today's epistle, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The gradual is taken from the Psalms. Our Savior here prays to be delivered from his enemies and protected from the rage of them that have risen up against him. Yet is he ready to do the will of his Father by whom he will be avenged. And the track which is also taken from the Psalms, the Messiah, under the name of Israel, complains of the persecution he has met with from the Jews, even from his youth. 
they are now about to scourge him in a most cruel manner. But he also foretells the punishment their deicide is to bring upon them. The gradual, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. Teach me to do thy will. Thou, O Lord, art my deliverer from the enraged Gentiles. Thou wilt put me out of the reach of those that assault me, and thou wilt rescue me from the unrighteous man. The tract. Many a time have they fought against me from my youth. Let Israel now say they have often attacked me from my youth, but they could not prevail over me. The wicked have wrought upon my back. They have lengthened their iniquity. The Lord, who is just, will cut the necks of sinners. The Gospel is the sequel of the Holy Gospel according to John chapter 8. At that time, Jesus said to the multitude of the Jews, Which of you shall convince me of sin? If I say the truth to you, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth the words of God. Therefore you hear them not, because you are not of God. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, Do not we say well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you have dishonored me. But I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Amen, amen, I say to you, if any man keep my word, he shall not see death forever. The Jews therefore said, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If any man keep my word, he shall not taste death forever. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom dost thou make thyself? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father that glorifieth me, of whom you say that he is your God, and you have not known him, but I know him. And if I shall say that I know him not, I shall be like to you a liar. But I do know him, and do keep his word. Abraham your father rejoiced that he might see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, Before Abraham was made, I am. They took up stones therefore to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The fury of the Jews is evidently at its height, and Jesus is obliged to hide himself from them. But he is to fall under their hands before many days are over. Then will they triumph and put him to death. They triumph, and Jesus is their victim. But how different is to be his lot from theirs. In obedience to the decrees of his heavenly Father, and out of love for men, he will deliver himself into the hands of his enemies, and they will put him to death. But he will rise victorious from the tomb. He will ascend into heaven. He will be thrown on the right hand of his Father. His enemies, on the contrary, after having vented all their rage, will live on without remorse until the terrible day come for their chastisement. That day is not far off, for observe the severity wherewith our Lord speaks to them. You hear not the words of God, because you are not of God. Yet there was a time when they were of God, for the Lord gives his grace to all men. But they have rendered this grace useless. They are now in darkness, and the light they have rejected will not return. You say that my Father is your God, and you have not known him, but I know him. Their obstinacy in refusing to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah has led these men to ignore that very God whom they boast of honoring. For if they knew the Father, they would not reject his Son. Moses and the Psalms and the prophets are all a dead letter to them. These sacred books are soon to pass into the hands of the Gentiles, who will both read and understand them. If, continues Jesus, I should say that I know him not, I should be like to you, a liar. This strong language is that of the angry judge, who is to come down at the last day to destroy sinners. Jerusalem has not known the time of her visitation. The Son of God has visited her. He is with her, and she dares to say to him, Thou hast the devil. She says to the eternal word, who proves himself to be God by the most astonishing miracles, that Abraham and the prophets are greater than he. Strange blindness that comes from pride and hardness of heart. The feast of the Pasch is at hand. These men are going to eat, and with much parade of religion, the flesh of the figurative lamb. They know full well that this lamb is a symbol or a figure which is to have its fulfillment. The true lamb is to be sacrificed by their hands, and they will not know him. He will shed his blood for them, and it will not save them. 
how this reminds us of those sinners for whom this Easter promises to be as fruitless as those of the past years. Let us redouble our prayers for them and beseech our Lord to soften their hearts, lest trampling the blood of Jesus under their feet, they should have it to cry vengeance against them before the throne of the Heavenly Father. At the offertory, confiding in the merits of the blood that has redeemed us, let us, in the words of the psalm, give praise to God and proclaim Him to be the author of that new life, of which the sacrifice of the Lamb is the never-failing source. The offertory, I will praise Thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. Reward Thy servant. I shall live and keep Thy commandments. Save me according to Thy word, O Lord. The sacrifice of the spotless lamb has produced two effects upon the sinner. It has broken his fetters and has made him the object of God's love. The church prays in the secret that the sacrifice which she is about to offer and which is one with that of the cross may work the same results in us. The secret. May these offerings, O Lord, both loosen the bonds of our wickedness and obtain for us the gifts of thy mercy. Against the persecutors of the church, Protect us, O Lord, while we assist at thy sacred mysteries, that being employed in acts of religion, we may serve thee both in body and mind. For the Pope, be appeased, O Lord, with the offering we have made, and cease not to protect thy servant, whom thou hast been pleased to appoint pastor over thy church. The communion antiphon is formed out of the very words spoken by Jesus when instituting the august sacrifice which has just been celebrated, and of which the priest and people have partaken in memory of the Passion, for it renews both the remembrance and the merits of the Passion. This is the body which shall be delivered up for you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, saith the Lord. As often as you receive them, do it in remembrance of me. In the post-communion, the church prays to God that he would maintain in the faithful the fruits of the visit he has so graciously paid them, for by their participation in the sacred mysteries, he has entered into them. The post-communions, help us, O Lord our God, and forever protect those whom thou hast refreshed with thy sacred mysteries. Against the persecutors of the church, we beseech thee, O Lord our God, not to leave exposed to the dangers of human life those whom thou hast permitted to partake of these divine mysteries. For the Pope, may the participation of this divine sacrament protect us, we beseech you, O Lord, and always procure safety and defense to thy servant, whom thou hast appointed pastor over the church, together with the flock committed to his charge. Vespers The office of Vespers, or Evening Song, consists firstly of the five following psalms and antiphons, According to our custom, we preface each psalm with a short explanation in order to draw attention to what is most in harmony with the spirit of the season. After the Pater and Ave have been said in secret, the church commences this hour with her favorite supplication. Deus in Agitori me mentende, Domini ad agiovenda me festina. Glorie Patri et Filio Spiritui Santo, sicut eret in principio et nunc et semper, et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Praise be to thee, O Lord, King of eternal glory, the Lord said. The first psalm is the prophecy of the future glory of the Messiah, but it also speaks of his humiliations. It tells of the triumphs of Christ, but before his exaltation, he is to drink of the torrent of sufferings. Psalm 109. The Lord said to my Lord, his son, Sit thou at my right hand and reign with me, until on the day of thy last coming I make thy enemies thy footstool. O Christ, the Lord thy Father, will send forth the scepter of thy power out of Zion. From thence rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. With thee is the principality in the day of thy strength and the brightness of the saints. For the Father has said to thee, From the womb before the day star I begot thee. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent. He has said, speaking to thee, the God-man, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, O Father, the Lord, thy Son, is at thy right hand. He hath broken kings in the day of his wrath. He shall also judge among nations in that terrible coming. He shall fill the ruins of the world. He shall crush the heads of the land of many. He cometh now in humility. He shall drink in the way of the torrent of sufferings. Therefore shall he lift up the head. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. The following psalm commemorates the mercies of God to his people. Of these, the greatest is his having given us Redeemer. He has made an eternal covenant with us 
but this covenant was signed with the blood of his own son. Psalm 110, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart, in the counsel of the just, and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, sought out according to all his wills. His work is praise and magnificence, and his justice continueth forever and ever. He hath made a remembrance of his wonderful works, being a merciful and gracious Lord. He hath given food to them that fear him. He will be mindful forever of his covenant with men. He will show forth to his people the power of his works that he may give them, his church, the inheritance of the Gentiles. The works of his hands are truth and judgment. All his commandments are faithful, confirmed forever and ever, made in truth and equity. He hath sent redemption to his people. He hath thereby commanded his covenant forever. Holy and terrible is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding to all that do it. His praise continueth forever and ever. Faithful are all his commandments confirmed forever and ever in his commandments. The next psalm sings the happiness of the just man and his hopes on the day of his Lord's coming. It tells us likewise of the confusion and despair which will torment the sinner who during life was insensible to his own interests and deaf to the invitations made him by the church. Psalm 111. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. He shall delight exceedingly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the righteous shall be blessed. Glory and wealth shall be in his house, and his justice remaineth forever and ever. To the righteous a light is risen up in darkness. He is merciful and compassionate and just. Acceptable is the man that showeth mercy and lendeth. He shall order his words with judgment, because he shall not be moved forever. The just shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not fear the evil hearing. His Lord is ready to hope in the Lord. His heart is strengthened. He shall not be moved until he look over his enemies. He hath distributed, he hath given to the poor. His justice remaineth for ever and ever. His horn shall be exalted in glory. The wicked shall see and shall be angry. He shall gnash with his teeth and pine away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. In his commandments he delightly exceedingly may in the name of the Lord. The psalm Laudate Pueri is the canticle of praise to the Lord, who, from his high heaven, has taken pity on the fallen human race and facilitated its return to its maker. Psalm 112 Praise the Lord, ye children. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from henceforth now and forever. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is as the Lord our God who dwelleth on high and looketh down on the low things in heaven and in earth, raising up the needy from the earth and lifting up the poor out of the dunghill, that he may place him with princes with the princes of his people, who maketh a barren woman to dwell in a house, the joyful mother of children. May the name of the Lord be forever blessed, we that live. The fifth psalm in Exitu recounts the prodigies witnessed under the ancient covenant. They were figures whose realities are to be accomplished in us if we will but return to the Lord our God. He will deliver Israel from Egypt, emancipate the Gentiles from their idolatry, and pour out a blessing on every man who will consent to fear and love the Lord. Psalm 113. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a barbarous people, Judea was made his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea saw and fled. Jordan was turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the hills like the lambs of the flock. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou didst flee? And thou, O Jordan, that thou wast turned back? Ye mountains that ye skipped like rams, and ye hills like lambs of the flock. At the presence of the Lord the earth was moved, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock in the pools of water, and the stony hills in the fountains of waters. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake, lest the Gentiles should say, Where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He hath done all things whatsoever he would. The idols of the Gentiles are silver and gold, the works of the hands of men. They have mouths and speak not. They have eyes and see not. They have ears and hear not. They have noses and smell not. They have hands and feel not. They have feet and walk not. Neither shall they cry out through their throat. Let them that make them become like unto them and all such as trust in them. The house of Israel hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. The house of Aaron hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. 
He that feareth the Lord hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. The Lord hath been mindful of us and hath blessed us. He hath blessed the house of Israel. He hath blessed the house of Aaron. He hath blessed all that fear the Lord, both little and great. May the Lord add blessings upon you, upon you, and upon your children. Blessed be you of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The heaven of heaven is the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead shall not praise thee, O Lord, nor any of them that go down to hell. But we that live bless the Lord from this time now and forever. We that live bless the Lord. After these five psalms, a short lesson from the Holy Scriptures is read. It is called Capitulum because it is always very short. The Capitulum, Hebrews chapter 9. Brethren, Christ being come and high priest of the good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. After the Capitulum follows the hymn, Vexile Regis. It is the hymn of the cross, composed by St. Venantius Fortunatus, at the request of St. Radegund. The standard of our King comes forth. The mystery of the cross shines upon us, that cross on which life suffered death, and by his death gave life. He was pierced with a cruel spear, that, by the water and the blood which flowed from the wound, he might cleanse us from sin. Here on the cross was fulfilled the prophecy foretold in David's truthful words, God hath reigned from the tree. O fair and shining tree, beatified by the scarlet of the king, and chosen as the noble trunk that was to touch such sacred limbs. O blessed tree, on whose arms hung the ransom of the world. It was the balance wherein was placed the body of Jesus, and thereby hell lost its prey. Hail, O cross, our only hope. During these days of the passion, increase to the good their grace, and cleanse sinners from their guilt. May every spirit praise thee, O holy trinity, thou font of salvation, and by the cross whereby thou gavest us victory, give us too our recompense. Amen. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Rescue me from the unjust man. Then is said the Magnificat Antiphon, which is to be found in the proper. The Antiphon of the Magnificat. Abraham your father rejoiced that he might see my day. He saw it and was glad. Let us pray. Mercifully look down on thy people. We beseech thee, O Almighty God, that by thy bounty and protection, they may be governed and guarded both in body and soul. After this, the church sings the Canticle of Mary, the Magnificat, in which are celebrated the divine maternity and all its consequent blessings. This exquisite canticle is an essential part of the Vespers throughout the year. Let us unite with all generations and call her blessed. But let us also enter into those sentiments of humility, which she recommends to us both by her words and her example. Her inspired lips speak to us this promise. If the great God, whose triumph is to gladden us on the glorious day of Easter, find us humble and submissive, he will exalt us, yea, raise us up even to himself. If we confess our misery and poverty to him, he will enrich us even to the full with every blessing. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation unto generation to them that fear him. He hath showed might in his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. He hath put down the mighty from their seed, and hath exalted the humble. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath received Israel his servant, being mindful of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. The Magnificat Antiphon is then repeated. The Antiphon of the Magnificat. Abraham your father rejoiced that he might see my day. He saw it and was glad. Let us pray. Mercifully look down on thy people. We beseech thee, O Almighty God, that by thy bounty and protection they may be governed and guarded both in body and soul. The Vespers end with the following versicles. Benedicamos Domino Deo gracias, fidelim anime per misericordiam de requiescan in pace. Amen. The following appropriate prayer is from the Mozarabic Breviary, the Capitulum. 
The course of the year has brought us to the time for celebrating with devout hearts and offices the feast of thy passion, O Jesus, Son of God, wherein, for our sake, thou didst suffer the calamities of thine enemies and was crucified by the wounds of them that betrayed thee. We pray and beseech thee that thou depart not from us, and whereas tribulation is nigh at hand, and there is none to help us, do thou, by the help of thy passion, become our sole protector. Deliver us not, therefore, into the hands of our enemies unto sin, but receive us as thy servants unto good, that the haughty ones who calumniate us, namely the enemies of our souls, may be repelled by the might of thy power. Thou, by the human nature, thou hast assumed, art the lamp set on the stand of the cross. We beseech thee, therefore, that thou enkindle us by thy flame, lest we become a prey to punishment. Behold us now entering with devout hearts upon the feast of thy passion. O oh, grant that we may partake of the merits of thy passion, that thus, being delivered from the air of our darkness, we may be fortified by the help of thy light. That we may the better honor the holy cross we give for each day of this week an appropriate hymn for one or other of the various ancient liturgies. The one we have selected for today is the composition of St. Venantius Fortunatus, Bishop of Portier. Brightly shineth the blessed cross, whereon hung the body of our Lord, when, with his blood, he washed our wounds. Become out of tender love for us a meek victim. This divine lamb did by the cross rescue us his sheep from the jaws of the wolf. Twas there, with his hands nailed to the wood, that he redeemed the world from ruin, and by his own death closed the way of death. Here was fastened with cruel nails that hand which delivered Paul from sin and Peter from death. O sweet and noble tree, how vigorous in thy growth, when on thy branches hang fruits so rare as these. Thy fresh fragrance gives resurrection to many that lay in the tomb, and restores the dead to life. He that shelters beneath thy shade shall not be scourged either by the moon at night or by the midday sun. Planted near the running waters, thou art lovely in thy verdure, and blossoms ever fresh blow on each fair branch. Between thine arms hangs the pendant vine, whence wine most sweet flows in a ruddy stream. 